Hi everyone, my name is Arya Fala. I'm an assistant professor here at neurosurgery at uh, UCLA. I am a pediatric neurosurgeon with a special interest in carry malformations and it's my great pleasure to speak uh, to you today about uh, common pitfalls in the management of uh, Chiari malformations. I have no conflicts of interest. So very quickly, so what is a Chiari malformation? Uh, so this is the relationship of uh, the uh, back of the brain, the brain stem, the spinal cord, and the cerebellum. And um, this is what things look like uh, uh, normally. And uh, a Chiari malformation, uh, it, you know, the definition is highly controversial. There's not even, you know, uh, it depends who you ask. But in general, what's mostly agreed upon is a tonsillar descent greater than five millimeters below the foramen magnum. The tonsil refers to the back uh, portion or the bottom portion of the uh, cerebellum. So as you can see here on the right, you can see that uh, the cerebellum is slipping into the spinal canal. And um, the major problem carrying malformations is really the flow of uh, brain fluid or cerebrospinal fluid down at the level of the foramen uh, magnum. So how common is a Chiari malformation? Uh, very quickly, so it's about uh, one million people in the United States have a Chiari malformation. And uh, the majority of the cases are diagnosed in late childhood, but it can definitely present in adulthood or also uh, earlier on uh, in children. Uh, Chiari 2 is uh, a, a distinct in entity that's um, uh, commonly seen in myelomeningocele. In fact, it's always associated with myelomeningocele. And the majority of these patients also have hydrocephalus. It tends to affect uh, 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 females slightly more than males. There's no particular ethnic or geographic distribution. Uh, very quickly, um, the genetic uh, pathology underlying Chiari's, um, there are, in the minority cases, a genetic link. But the majority of cases, we still have not found a genetic link. And uh, for those that are related, it seems to be mostly linked to chromosome 9 and 15. And uh, the current thinking that is this is maybe a possible mesodermal uh, disorder or a, a disorder of the connective tissues that leads to a smaller posterior fossa. This is the back portion of the brain where the cerebellum is housed. And uh, by having a small posterior fossa, the cerebellum herniates into the uh, spinal canal. Very quickly, uh, the different types of carry malformations. Uh, for the majority, we're going to be talking essentially about type 1 Chiari malformations that tend to be most common. Here, um, syringomyelia can be associated with more than uh, half of, uh, uh, more than half the time. There can occasionally be skull anomalies, uh, platybasia, ventral compression. There's a lower incidence of hydrocephalus, but certainly can be present. The Chiari 2 is very commonly uh, associated with just myelomeningocele and um, uh, there's a higher frequency of hydrocephalus. These children, um, it's uh, quite unusual that they would require an operation for their Chiari, but uh, it can happen. These kids should certainly be followed as well. Type 3 refers to a encephalocele where the uh, portion of the brain is um, uh, pooching out through the back of the skull. And type 4 is a term that's not widely used but it uh, refers to a small cerebellum or a lack of uh, cerebellum. So again, today we're mostly talking about type 1 Chiari's. So what are the structures that are at risk in a Chiari malformation? So, there's, um, so we're looking at the direct potential compression of the cerebellum, which is the major control center for balance um, and coordination of the body. Compression of the brain stem, which is the major pathway and highway uh, in the brain that uh, controls the most vital functions, such as breathing, and, uh, heart rate, and um, swallowing, and those functions. And also the uh, spinal cord, uh, which uh, carries all the motor and sensory information uh, and control to the rest of the body. We're also looking at compression of the cranial nerves, which are the nerve roots that come from the brain stem. Um, disruption of the natural flow of brain fluid through this area, uh, potentially elevated uh, pressures in the brain, and also damage to potential nerves in the spine as well. 
So very quickly, just to review uh, CSF flow, this is a very important concept uh, that uh, one must know to understand uh, the problems that happen as a result of uh, carry malformations. So normally, uh, brain fluid, the majority of it is made in the lateral ventricles, which are these top chambers in the, in the brain. They flow through the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle. And really in Chiari's, the major problem is because of the slump of the cerebellum into the uh, spinal canal that, um, excuse me, that um, uh, the brain fluid doesn't flow normally at this level and can lead to elevated pressures and that's how the symptoms uh, may uh, present. <laughs> So, um, sorry. So, um, brain fluid once it goes through here and bathes the spinal cord and uh, brain, it gets absorbed by the granulations, these tissues uh, uh, that's on the surface of uh, the brain. So, caries can present very differently in many people. The most uh, uh, these are so three different patients all presenting with caries. It can present as a very particular headache uh, uh, at the back of the head that can be exacerbated by coughing, sneezing, laughing, um, bearing down, going to the bathroom, and all those and, uh, it can present like that. It can present in neck pain, um, weakness or numbness or tingling in the arms and legs, uh, respiratory problems, specifically sleep apnea, trouble with swallowing. Um, but there's also m many other symptoms of caries that not, is not so easily explained. So when you go down the list, you start finding things like um, problems with speech and cognition and particularly memory. So there's a lot we still need to find out about, uh, learn about caries. And uh, some are very easily explained by the structures at, list, at risk. But um, uh, perhaps there's a greater network disorder that can affect uh, uh, individuals very differently. And there's, there's things that we can't um, uh, easily explain, such as you know, memory, memory loss. Is that whether that's due to uh, high pressures in the head or whether they're, they're due to um, white matter tracts where the cerebellum connects with different parts of the brain. So there's a lot uh, to learn still about uh, Chiari malformations. A very important thing, uh, you know, to, to uh, mention up front is Chiaris can be found very commonly and just because you have a Chiari does not mean that you require an operation. So the, what we call incidentally found uh, Chiaris. So patient, this patient on the left had an MRI scan for a head injury for a concussion and got an MRI that led to, led to this and found to have a Chiari where the tonsils have herniated more than five millimeters um, into the spinal canal, but this patient is absolutely asymptomatic and does not require any treatment for their uh, Chiari at all. So it's very important nowadays, especially you know, with, with, with the internet and Google, for uh, patients to, you know, it's important to be well informed, but um, I just saw a recent study actually that Doctors are still outperforming Google in terms of their, so that's, that's good to hear. So, so very important to, um, uh, to ensure that uh, the symptoms um, uh, are due to a Chiari, and that's the only way you can treat a patient with it. Um, so it's very important to be well informed, but also be careful what you read online. There's this acronym that's thrown around in medicine right now, it's called VOMIT, Victim of Modern Imaging Technology. We find a lot of things uh, nowadays, because our MRIs are so good and they're so available, but just because you, uh, something is found doesn't mean that uh, the patient requires any uh, treatment. So the, so the typical sequence of events and what we, what we learn in medical school, what we like to do, is uh, any good uh, clinician and any good uh, encounter with healthcare first comes with a history, right? So speaking to your doctor, figuring out what your symptoms are, and describing the nature of your symptoms and how they affect you. And, and there's no different in Chiari uh, malformations. This is where we start. Second step is a physical examination where the doctor can confirm or disconfirm findings that may um, uh, uh, push him or her towards diagnosing you with a certain disorder. The third step is the imaging that we obtain. And if, if these, these uh, line up, 
and you may have a, a diagnosis of a Chiari. However, frequently what we see in, uh, in our clinics is there's an MRI that's done, finding, uh, there's a finding, and now we have to go back and try to decipher the history and physical. So, so this is very important because, you know, I can't stress this enough because as a surgeon, you know, your, your ability to help patients really comes down to, most importantly, an accurate diagnosis. So the evaluation of Chiari, we're really looking at th these three main uh, structures, the relationship with the brainstem, cerebellum, and spinal cord. This is, this is sort of in a, uh, to simplify it, obviously we're also looking at the uh, bony um, uh, uh, anatomical relationship at the base of the skull to the spine. We're also looking at other uh, findings such as syringomyelia, which is abnormal fluid accumulation in the spinal cord. So the diagnosis and evaluation, commonly we may ask for an entire MRI of the brain and spinal cord. We may assess for special MRIs so we can assess the flow of cerebrospinal fluid, uh, particularly at the back of uh, the brain at the level of the foramen magnum. In certain situations, we may ask for an upright uh, MRI. Uh, very important, especially in children, to obtain CT scans of the uh, craniocervical junction. This is where the head meets uh, the spine because those bony relationships can be quite uh, abnormal. We consider a sleep study for patients that have symptoms related to uh, sleep apnea. Uh, perhaps consider a neurology consult when uh, uh, patients are complaining of uh, headaches because there's a, a thousand different headache syndrome and it's very important for us to distinguish a Chiari headache from very other typical headaches like migraines and tension headaches and cluster headaches and so on and uh, also an ophthalmology consult to look for evidence of increased uh, pressure uh, behind the eyes. Sometimes there's uh, nystagmus, which is abnormal jerky movements of the eye, and this can all be related to uh, Chiari malformations. So what is the natural history of Chiari? Uh, what, what happens to patients with Chiari who are not treated in any way? So natural history suggests that it, that uh, the symptoms can be stable for many years, but some patients do undergo intermittent periods of deterioration. And if you look in the um, literature, there's these rare um, uh, case reports of spontaneous improvement, especially sometimes with, uh, with syring, so syringomyelia, where you know, there's fluid collection, and over time it's followed, nothing's done, and you know, the, the fluid collection is, is less. But this is more uh, debated. And what are the outcomes following Chiari decompression? So headaches improve in about 85% of patients. Uh, neurological deficits, depending on what they are and how long, uh, how long standing those symptoms uh, may be, they may also improve in a greater proportion of patients. And uh, seldom do patients not improve after an operation. And that's again, comes down to um, a good diagnosis, picking the right patient to offer surgery to and carrying out the surgery with um, uh, very low morbidity. I'm going to show you these pictures just, in a, uh, just to give you a sense of what uh, this, uh, some of the steps are. Uh, this is what we're looking at. We're looking at where the blue is, we're removing that bone, at the back of the skull, and uh, here we visualize the dura, which is the covering on top of the uh, uh, spinal cord and cerebellum. And um, quite often it's a controversial step whether or not we open the dura um, to, uh, uh, to give the back of the brain more room. And here often we can sew in a uh, dural patch. And lastly, we, we put a sealant on there to make sure there's no uh, brain fluid. Now this operation can be done in many, many ways. And um, there's no one way that's better than uh, the rest. So uh, again, showing you this, so this is really important. So one of the uh, key things you want to look at um, on the MRI would be, uh, uh, you know, you really want to study each patient, each patient scan looks different. You need to know uh, how low uh, the bottom uh, of the tonsils are, to what level in the spine are they coming to. You need to know the anatomical relationships of major blood vessels, that major veins that run in the back of the skull. You need to think about the age of the patient. You need to think about the symptoms, whether or not there's a syrinx or not. All these factor in um, into your surgical decision making and your surgical plan. 
Also, the other thing I didn't mention is uh, sort of the, uh, the bony relationships at the, at the base of the skull. Commonly, a patient's uh, positioned this way, and, this, and we call this the prone position. So they're lying on their front with their head uh, flexed. Um, the incision is uh, really important. This is, a, this is showing you a Y-shaped incision uh, at the level of the, the fascia, which is what I like to do because this tends to, uh, at least in my experience, lowers the, uh, the possibility of CSF leak or brain fluid leak to the outside when all the tissue planes aren't uh, lined up. Um, and then removing bone and knowing how much to, uh, to remove is also critical because you can run into problems, and I'll show you in a, in, a, in a second, whether removing too little or too much bone can both be problematic uh, for the patient. Um, lastly, being able to very safely lift up uh, the bottom portion of the back of the skull, and uh, you know whether or not, again, this is uh, uh, somewhat more controversial, whether or not we open the dura, which is the covering around uh, the, uh, the brain and spinal cord, and whether we create uh, room there for, um, to alleviate the Chiari symptoms. So it's really important to know that whenever uh, the facts are very few, experts are many. So um, this goes to show you that you know, what I say is mostly based on you know, my personal experiences and my mentors that I have worked with um, and you know, some of their own biases. So, so really anyone, you know, some of the things that I'll show you can be very controversial depending on who you go and who your surgeon is. Their, their thoughts and attitudes may, may be very different. So this is very important to know. So what I wanted to focus on today, that was just a prelude about, I want to show you some of the cases um, that, uh, you know, where, uh, you know, we have seen patients um, that uh, have had uh, complications um, or, and, and most importantly, focus on the pitfalls and how we can prevent uh, these complications and how to, how to do the right surgery the first time. So this is, some of this is, you know, um, geared, I guess, more towards surgeons, but it's, I think it's very important for uh, patients or uh, parents of patients to, to know these things, and it would help you understand the decision making and uh, also the process, and also understand some of the complications that may happen. So I'm going to first focus on this. This is sort of the, perhaps the most um, controversial aspect of uh, the surgical management of Chiari, whether or not you open the dura versus not opening the dura. There's several advantages to not opening the dura, and there's some disadvantages to opening the dura. So um, I personally, again, this is my bias, I tend to always, I should, I don't like using the word always, but I tend to more often than not open the dura, and, in, and, in, uh, and that is based on uh, my my experience and I've seen, you know, generally um, if a patient requires a bony only decompression in my hands, it's either that they're too small and if they're too little, the risks of opening the dura can be quite high. Um, and, you know, unless there's any other uh, contraindication to opening the dura, I generally tend to open the dura because I get better results that way. Um, but, but, but here's the argument. So, um, uh, you know, some of the morbidity of this operation comes with opening the dura. So, so advocates of the no duroplasty approach say that uh, you can avoid a pseudomeningocele, which means a fluid pocket at the back of uh, the head where the incision is. You can prevent CSF leaks, and obviously some of those CSF leaks may lead to meningitis if not appropriately treated. So you can uh, minimize those risks, decreased operative time, shorter hospital stay, and perhaps a quicker return to normal activity. And all those seem great. Um, but uh, there's disadvantages to not opening the, the, the dura. Um, and that's uh, the most um, concerning one for me is that the, the Chiari may be suboptimally treated. So these are patients that may require additional operations to take care of their symptoms, or they may have a partial resolution of their symptoms. So, um, and this is something that we don't see uh, that infre infrequently where a bone, the only decompression is done and some of these patients still have symptoms requiring additional surgery. Obviously, additional surgery uh, carries more risk. It's always riskier to do a redo operation than, a, than uh, the first time operation because of scar tissue and so on. This is one of the studies I, I, I pulled up uh, comparing uh, 
no duroplasty to duroplasty. And as you can see in the um, no duroplasty group, the surgical recurrence rate where they have to go back in and reoperate is about 12.5% compared to the duroplasty group, which shows a 3% surgical uh, recurrence rate. Now, the complications on the duroplasty were a little bit higher. So these are things like CSF leak or uh, infections that can happen. Surgery is longer whenever you open the dura. You stay in hospital a little bit longer, and the average hospital costs are a little bit higher as well. But you know the jury's not out. And most importantly, um, I don't think you can um, predict which patients you may get away with without opening the dura. Now, most surgeons agree that whenever there's a syrinx or a fluid buildup within the spinal cord, that um, a duroplasty approach may be better, and most pediatric neurosurgeons uh, would probably agree that if the child is really little, maybe less than four years of age, that opening the dura can be quite risky because there's some really large blood vessels that run through uh, uh, the back, which I'll uh, demonstrate. I'll show you one of the cases uh, coming up. So uh, how do we prevent CSF leaks? This comes down to uh, you know, good surgical technique. There are some surgeons that believe that every CSF leak is potentially uh, preventable. And um, uh, here you see a little pocket of fluid, the dark area. That's, uh, that's called a pseudomeningocele or fluid um, uh, at the back of the, uh, at the surgical site. And uh, showing you a couple operative pictures, but what we do here to try to prevent that is very careful technique when we, when we use a patch, whether the patch can be a synthetic material or from the patient's own um, uh, tissues, to very carefully suture in this patch in a watertight fashion to make sure that there's no uh, fluid leak as best as you can. We can, uh, and this is what it uh, looks like usually when we're done. You see all the stitches around this patch. It gives uh, the back of the brain more room. And you can, you can supplement this also with a dural sealant that will give you the best chance of, of uh, um, preventing a CSF leak. Uh, the other thing, as, as an aside, I'll tell you that uh, one of the other factors to prevent a CSF leak is to make sure that you have not uh, operated on a patient that also has um, uh, hydrocephalus, that's occult, because if the pressure in the head is, is high, no matter how good a job you do here, you're going to have a fluid leak. The, 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 the fluid will find its way out. So that's really important. That, that comes down to patient uh, selection. So I'll show you a few examples of some of the pitfalls. This one's more related to uh, a misdiagnosis, but uh, I'll show you many other cases where uh, we can, uh, you know, we can uh, troubleshoot through some of the pitfalls of the operation. This is a patient uh, th that we saw, so the not so obvious patient with Chiari. The MRI is done. Looks like the tonsils are uh, a bit low perhaps meeting the definition, just barely meeting the definition of Chiari, that five millimeters. But her story seemed so um, uh, convincing for a Chiari malformation. And the, the symptoms were, were uh, really, really convincing. So it's very important that when you see that, now this patient also had um, uh, EDS, or Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, where the tissues are more uh, stretchy than, uh, than usual. So this is a patient that we uh, recommended to do a standing MRI. And you can see that the uh, tonsils herniated a little bit more uh, when they were standing, and the, the flow of uh, brain fluid was a little bit more disrupted. And obviously for this patient, anytime they would get up to do their daily activities, they get symptomatic, but when they would lie down, they'd feel a lot better. And, on, and, and the way we get our MRI scans, we're usually lying down. So we, we get our imaging lying down, but when you know our, our world we're standing up most of the time, so there's a disconnect there. So, so in this patient, um, the, the Chiari was a little bit more obvious when uh, you got her to do a standing MRI. And this, and this uh, young girl did uh, miraculously well after an operation. She did really well. Here we show that we've decompressed uh, the back. We've sutured in the patch, just um, quite a good space there for, for CSF. And a lot of her symptoms uh, resolved after this operation. So this comes down to you know, making sure you pick the right patient. I can also show you many scans of patients with similar looking MRIs, but if you, don't, if you take the time to listen to the history, the, the symptoms don't uh, fit that of a Chiari malformation. So it's very important to listen to your patient because an identical looking MRI in another patient could be one that you actually don't want to operate on because 
you're not going to be able to help that patient at all with, uh, with surgery. So avoiding blood loss is key, and this is something I can't stress enough, especially as a pediatric neurosurgeon, where uh, you, know, you need to know the, the venous anatomy. And, and in kids, there's a, um, there's a vein uh, at the back, it's called the occipital vein, that can quite often be in your way. And this is a source of uh, sometimes a lot of blood loss uh, for, for some uh, surgeons. And uh, losing blood uh, can lead to a lot of um, downstream uh, consequences of um, adhesions and, uh, and, and, and problems. So this is something that you want to be very cognizant of. You need to know the venous anatomy and where the veins are and how do you prevent blood loss. Just so you know, uh, you get a sense of the amount of blood uh, that uh, an individual may have. So when you operate on babies, so this is a nine pound old uh, newborn, the amount of blood volume is that of a soda can. So as you can imagine, it doesn't take a lot uh, in that patient to lose you know, half their blood volume. So you have to be extremely, extremely careful about that. Uh, this is a 60 pound child. The blood volume equals that of one large two liter uh, uh, soda uh, bottle. And in an adult, it's about uh, uh, two liters, uh, so two two-liter bottles. So this is really key, very important. But I would say even in the adult patient, you want to minimize blood loss as much as you can, and especially blood loss after the door is open, because that blood uh, can get into uh, the, um, uh, we call the subarachnoid space, and really cause a lot of scarring and problems down the road. So these are things that your surgeon needs to take into account and really study that MRI and study that uh, individual patient's anatomy before they take on an operation because you can run into a lot of trouble if you don't plan for these things ahead of time. So here uh, is a patient that presented to me after a um, uh, Chiari decompression uh, surgery that only involved the removal of uh, the, uh, the back portion of the bone. The dura was not open at all. The, uh, the back portion of the C1 lamina was not removed and uh, this patient um, had some relief of their symptoms but eventually the symptoms all returned and as you can see there's a large amount of uh, syringomyelia fluid within the spinal cord which is quite concerning. So uh, in this case uh, you know we recommended actually completing the bony decompression that needs to happen which in involves also removing the back, back part of the C1 bone as well as opening the dura to allow more space and a more normal flow of CSF in that area. And that's what we did here as you can see the uh, brain MRI on the right side. You can see the patch in there that allows a lot of space at the back and if you look at the syrinx here in the spinal cord it's really uh, starting to resolve. So the syrinx can usually take about six months to nine months to, to resolve, and sometimes even longer than that. But that's a good marker uh, for how well uh, the patient's doing. And especially, you know, you always, I always obtain full spinal MRIs on every patient with a Chiari because I want to know and document whether or not they have a syrinx. So if we, we operate on them, I want to make sure that the syrinx uh, goes down in size. And more importantly, if they didn't have a syrinx, you want to make sure after your surgery they don't develop one. So here's the opposite problem, where a patient had too much bony removal at the back of the, uh, uh, at the, back of the um, occiput, the back of the skull, and you can see that the cerebellum uh, is sort of sagging down and obstructing the brain fluid um, uh, channels at the back of the brain. And you can see a pretty impressive and sizable syrinx uh, over there as well. And you can see that syrinx goes all the way down and, and, and involves much of the spinal cord. So here's a situation where we have to undo some of that bony removal. Obviously we don't have bone to put back, but uh, we can, um, you know, this is just showing you the skull and how much, uh, you know, the, the width of the foramen magnum, and you don't need to remove more bone than the um, width of that opening at the base of the skull. So anything more than that can potentially put the patient at risk of having the cerebellum sag down too much. So here we go, uh, we went in and put in a titanium uh, buttress to, to sort of recreate that bone that was, um, that was removed. And this uh, helped the patient quite a bit. As you can see, the cerebellum is sagging a little bit less, uh, 
And importantly, you can see that the uh, syrinx is smaller than before. I, I think this is an early MRI, so if you were to get an MRI even later, you'd see that syrinx gets smaller and smaller. And also, you can see it within the entire uh, spinal cord. So prevention of severe blood loss. So this is a patient that we saw. So this patient does not actually have a Chiari. They had a uh, lesion, a small brain tumor at the back of the cerebellum. Uh, but what had happened is uh, uh, the patient was taking a surgery and there was severe blood loss. So, so more than a liter of blood loss in this uh, region. So perhaps, uh, I'm not sure, you know, can't really tell where that blood loss uh, came from. Perhaps it was the large veins or the sinuses at the back of the skull. But what happened in this patient is they developed a Chiari type syndrome where the back of the cerebellum was herniating into uh, the uh, spinal canal and this patient developed a syrinx where previously they had no syrinx. So they're scarring all along the spinal axis as a result of severe blood loss. You can see the syrinx over there. And this becomes a very, very difficult problem uh, to manage. Uh, because whenever you have too much scar tissue, it's very difficult to get rid of it. Surgery, by its very nature, creates uh, scar tissue. So to, to do surgery to remove scar tissue is uh, uh, pretty challenging. So this is a patient that we had to re-explore the posterior fossa, take down some of those adhesions, and eventually actually required a shunt in the uh, fourth ventricle, the back portion, the fluid, and as you can see, on this latest MRI, the spinal cord, the syrinx, is almost completely uh, resolved, but the damages that have occurred because of that syrinx formation and loss of some of the pain, uh, sorry, uh, loss of temperature sensation in, in the hands have become permanent. So obviously, as neurosurgeons, we're a lot better at preventing problems than, you know, uh, fixing neurological problems. We can't really, we don't have the ability to do that, uh, but uh, this, is, this is a case where Severe blood loss led to multiple uh, operations for this patient that could have been avoided with um, uh, a good operation the first time. This is a patient that we, we commonly, especially in the pediatric clinic, um, uh, Chiari with scoliosis. Children can have quite severe uh, Chiari, and we don't know the exact uh, relationship uh, with uh, uh, Chiaris and scoliosis, but this is a common. Uh, finding, especially if a patient that has a leftward uh, curve to their, to their scoliosis, and especially if they have any neurological symptoms, you want to be very careful and image these children right away. And if you see a Chiari you, or hydrocephalus, those are the two things uh, that can happen, or a syringomyelia, you want to make sure you refer right away to, to a, a neurosurgeon. This patient uh, was referred to me after they started losing strength on the left side a lot of muscle atrophy on the left side. And uh, unfortunately, when we see that, we, I mean, obviously we wanna offer a surgery right away uh, for the Chiari, uh, but uh, we know that our ability to get all that strength back will be uh, limited because the sooner you can act on this, the more likely that there won't be any uh, long-term uh, uh, damage. Very important when you see this is to also get a complete MRI of the brain as well because what you don't want to miss is hydrocephalus. If you got a fluid buildup in the brain, that needs to be treated first. Second order of business would be a Chiari. And lastly, if the, and, and a lot of times when you take care of that, uh, the, um, uh, some of the scoliosis can, uh, progression can stop and sometimes get a little bit better. But more importantly, you, know, you stop that progression. Some of these kids don't require surgery, but some do. But it's very important that the, that the spine operation does not get done first if a patient has a Chiari or, or hydrocephalus. And in this child, uh, we were able to, this is the immediate post-operative MRI, but we were able to uh, uh, do a decompression and uh, some of the symptoms, particularly the headaches, got better right away, but the strength will take much more time uh, for it to improve. Um, so th this is another uh, case example where uh, this child, was found to have a Chiari, quite symptomatic, uh, uh, young boy, five years of age, um, has central sleep apnea, would often stop breathing uh, at night because of their severe uh, Chiari. If you can tell, the tonsils there are past the C2 level, so they're quite, quite low. Um, and uh, there's a lot of compression on the brain stem, as you can tell. Uh, 
So this patient definitely required an operation. The other thing uh, that we can see looking at this MRI was a very large occipital side, a very large vein in this child that obviously if the surgeon doesn't look at, can, you can get torrential bleeding very, very quickly. So that's very important to, to notice just based on the first MRI. But um, uh, it's very important to try to, and, and at least as much as you can, to try to prevent the removal of the C2 uh, uh, arch. And uh, I say that because a lot of the important ligaments and muscles that support the head actually connect to the back of the C2. So by taking down the C2 arch, uh, the back portion of uh, uh, the spinal um, uh, level, you can cause a lot of disruption and instability. So, um, so here in this case, when the, when the tonsils go all the way down, here's a great case where I would consider a tonsillar reduction, either resection or cauterization to shrink those tonsils and elevate them um, instead of uh, you know, removing more bone. And uh, this is what it looks like. This is an anatomical view. These are what a lot of our neurosurgical textbooks look like. Uh, the tonsils are shown there at the bottom portion of the spinal cord. And really the main goal of this operation for me personally in my hands is I decompress until I can see the fourth ventricle very clearly and specifically the choroid plexus which is the tissue that creates all that brain fluid. And when I see pulsatile flow of brain fluid in that area, that's when I know that's my end point for the operation. So, so uh, that's how I approach it. Uh, this child had a decompression as well. As you can see, we were actually able to shrink the tonsil. So from be below the C2 level, we shrunk it all the way up. And you can see, see there's much more. Uh, uh, the, the flow at that level is, uh, is reestablished. And this patient's symptoms all uh, uh, improved as well. Um, this is one of the last uh, cases I'm showing. So uh, very important, uh, especially in children, especially when there's other uh, congenital malformations to uh, have a good understanding of the base of the skull. And also very important to, to recognize whether the, de whether the compression to the brain stem is coming from uh, the front, which is what we call a ventral decompression, versus the back, which is a dorsal decompression. Some would argue, and uh, it's becoming uh, less popular now, but some would still argue that if the compression is from the front, that the patient needs an operation um, uh, from the front uh, because you can do an operation at the back and not have done much uh, for that patient. Obviously operations from the front uh, carry a lot more morbidity so we try to abo avoid them uh, as much as possible. This is not my uh, patient but this is an example uh, situation where um, a decompression was uh, taken from the front again understanding the complex relationship uh, of the uh, structures in the uh, uh, front of the skull here you can see the top portion of the C2 vertebrae, the C1 vertebrae, and even the clivus, which is the base of the skull, was uh, completely removed to deal with the pathology. Um, and, uh, but very important, these patients to follow them long term, and especially when you do this type of operation, the patient definitely requires uh, fusion in the back. You need to fuse the occiput to the uh, spine to prevent a uh, deformity. And um, uh, obviously this, this operation we also don't do lightly because this actually, um, uh, the patients lose more than half of their mobility. So your ability to say yes, your ability to say no, shaking your head up, down, you lose all that. So um, in certain cases these are necessary and, uh, and we need to follow patients along to make sure that they don't develop a kyphosis or their head slumping over on top of their spine. But in certain patients this is uh, very necessary. So uh, my last slide here, so out outcomes after surgery. So the, so the things that are most likely to improve are headaches and neck pain, um, uh, breathing problems, sleep apnea, and scoliosis can definitely at least uh, uh, stabilize, if not improve. And less likely to improve are brainstem spinal cord symptoms. Usually there's when there's been an injury, depending on how severe the injury was and how long that injury was there, the less likelihood of that uh, function uh, to return. And uh, symptom recurrence, so uh, some patients may experience recurrence of their symptoms up to 22% uh, uh, experience mild or moderate symptom recurrence and about 7% severe uh, symptom recurrence. So it's very important to 
uh, especially for children, once you've treated the Chiari, to continue following them at least up until through puberty because that's still when the, the relationship, the anatomy is still changing. Uh, so you want to you make sure that they don't uh, run into problems. Usually once they've reached the age of skeletal maturity and there's a good decompression, there's no concerns, uh, you can um, uh, you know, um, see them less often. And syringomyelias usually uh, resolve as well after uh, surgery. So these are some additional resources uh, that I encourage you to, to look at that may give you some additional information that could be quite helpful. And uh, thank you for your time, and it's been a pleasure. Thank you.